Hey everyone, welcome back to our Harkla YouTube channel. We're so happy to have you. I'm Rachel. And I'm Jessica, and we are the Certified Occupational Therapy Assistants with Harkla. Today we're going to talk about picky eating, and we're going to give you five fun activities and strategies to use if you have a picky eater. I know you do. <laughs> okay, let me first disclaimer and say I am in the season of picky eating right now with my two year old and it's exhausting. So, in solidarity, I am here with you. I'm going to give you all of these resources and strategies that I am using, but you know, it's hard. I was in that season seven years ago. You don't even remember. <laughs> I have worked <laughs> with many children who were picky eaters as well. But I think it's important to talk about the difference between like normal picky eating phases that children go through that we expect them to go through and a child who's a picky eater who cannot mm -hmm. tolerate certain foods because there is a difference. Yes. I almost think it should be celebrated. We should change the narrative here when a child does become a picky eater because they are identifying their preferences and they're learning to control what they can control. And it's a really big developmental leap for them to be able to say, no, I don't want that or this is what I'm going to be eating instead of, you know, reframing it as such a negative thing. So picky eating is tough, but it is normal. It's a very typical thing to happen around two to four years, sometimes a little earlier, sometimes a little bit later. Um, but it is, it's a common normal thing and we just need to expect it. Yeah. And the difference here is that a picky eater that we're going to kind of be focused on, focus today. on mm -hmm. today is a child who the picky eating is all of the time. It lasts throughout childhood into the older years and they can't even tolerate being around certain foods. And we're going to list some specific examples here in just a minute, but just know that there is a difference mm -hmm. and it's important to identify if you're in a picky eating phase with your child mm -hmm. or if your child is a picky eater and it's a major concern. Mm -hmm. Be really conscious of the language that you're using around your child when you're describing their eating habits. We don't need to say, my child's a picky eater. You're a picky eater. You don't like this. You don't like that. Be very mindful of the things that you're saying around your child. I refuse to call Trip a picky eater. I don't let any family members or friends say, oh, he's a picky eater. I'm like, no, we're not going to say that. We're just going to talk about what he is eating and the sensory components, which we'll talk about all the, all the strategies later on, but just something to be mindful of as you are going through this journey. Now, a picky eater is often seen in combination with other things like autism or ADHD or sensory processing disorder. And we're not saying that they're always connected. We're just saying that in our clinical experience, we've seen these connections, specifically with sensory processing challenges or sensory processing disorder because of all the sensory properties of food, the taste, the smell, the look, the sound, the feel. Right, you're looking at what five different at senses five, yeah. when you're eating and drinking something. So, looking at it from a sensory perspective is great, but these picky eaters often also have other sensory processing challenges. Just think that's important to note. You know, I was just thinking about the five senses you just mentioned. I think that we can take eating and wrap in the other three hidden senses. With interoception, you have to identify if you're full or hungry. With proprioceptive, you have to be able to maintain an upright position with good postural control in the chair that you're sitting on. But also some foods have proprioceptive properties if they're crunchy or yep. chewy or resistive. And your vestibular system is connected to balance. So again, you have to be able to maintain that upright position. If you're drinking okay. from a cup, maybe oh, you're tipping your there head it in. Is. So you're right, we can combine okay. or we can connect all eight sensory systems to eating. 
So we both worked with kids who are picky eaters in the clinical setting. As we've mentioned, we are pediatric occupational therapy assistants by trade. And this is really when a child has, I'd say like 10 or less foods. They're often dropping foods. So maybe it's 10 and the next week, maybe it's nine. Maybe they've kind of just balanced here for a while, but they're really not open to expanding their food repertoire at all. These are also kids who cannot even be around a non-preferred food. Food. If they smell it or see it in the kitchen, they have a big reaction. They can't even tolerate to have that non-preferred food on their plate. And I like to use the example of my son, Logan, because I do remember one specific instance when he was younger of we would have like mushrooms in some of our dishes and him being a picky eater at the time, but not a picky eater forever, he was able to tolerate those non-preferred mushrooms in his food. He just picked them out. Mm -hmm. But if this was a child who was struggling with picky eating to the point where they couldn't even tolerate that, there would be a big reaction as soon as they saw those mushrooms and they wouldn't even be able to tolerate being near them and seeing them. Chiming in, in my current journey, we are, my kiddos too, and one night we had like fried rice with vegetables and oh, sounds so good. meat and stuff in it. And usually it's a, it's a preferred food, but knowing some external factors of my son being extra hungry or hangry, a little tired, like things just weren't right. And he was losing it and made me pick out all of the things that he did not want in his food and put it on the side of his plate. But last night we had fried rice again with veggies and everything and he ate it just fine without any issues. So I think that's important to keep in mind too. Just because your child does have a reaction, a non-preferred reaction to food, we have to remain neutral. I mean, I was laughing the first time because it was so hilarious <laughs> how big of a extravagant reaction. Extravagant it yeah. was. <laughs> But just knowing that it's important to stay neutral in those situations as well. But picky eaters, picky eating phases, that's why it's important to kind of discern the two and not just lump them all into one because they are completely different. Yeah. Like we already mentioned, picky eaters will often have noticeable sensory processing challenges with other daily activities. They might be an extreme sensory avoider where they can't tolerate movement or they can't tolerate certain types of clothes on their skin. They might be sensory cravers or seekers where they seek out intense movement and they're always on the go. But you're going to notice these other sensory components in other areas as well. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes with those picky eaters, there is a communication barrier. Maybe the child is preverbal or they use a communication device or maybe they use sign language, but there might be a communication barrier that they can't explain or express how they're feeling about these certain food options. And then we also see low muscle tone in picky eaters. Oftentimes they have low muscle tone throughout their core and their upper and lower body, but also in their mouth and their oral structures. And even going along with that, they might have some tongue ties or lip ties that are causing difficulty with eating a variety of foods. You think about how much your tongue moves in your mouth when you're eating. Your cheeks are constantly like pushing the food back to where your teeth are and your tongue is constantly moving it to where it needs to be. Not like this, but like one side at a time. <laughs> but there's a lot of coordinated movements that have to flow in order to successfully eat. And if something isn't working efficiently, it's gonna make your child not want to eat or only want to eat certain food textures, flavors. Yeah. Quick side note, if you are concerned with your child's picky eating, they have less than 10 foods, they have other sensory processing concerns or low muscle tone, make sure you seek out an occupational therapy evaluation or a speech language pathologist, pathologist to get evaluated for some of those other concerns that are happening because that in-person therapy is going to give you the most benefit. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that we've given you tons of little sprinkled tips and advice in this video, let's get to our specific strategies to help if you have a picky eater or if you are in that season right now. We're gonna give you five strategies here, but just know that underneath these five strategies are other strategies <laughs> that kind of fit in there. So there's gonna be a lot here. Try it's not like to 25. get yeah, try not to get <laughs> overwhelmed. Pick one thing and try it consistently for a week or two. 
pick another thing, try it consistently for a week or two. Don't try to do all of it at once. Just one thing at a time. Try not to get overwhelmed. Okay, let's do it. The first strategy is to go slow and make it fun. And you can do this in a variety of ways of making the different meals more fun, but mostly just going slow and following your child's lead. From what I've found both clinically and personally, the less you force your child to eat, the less pressure there is, the more they will eat. It sounds weird, I know, but it helps us. Talk about the different sensory components of the food during mealtime or during play. If you're doing a lot of playtime with food, make sure you're talking about the color, the texture, the feel of it. Does it make noise when you touch it? Does it change color if it's heated or cooled off? Like talk about all of those different sensory components in a very neutral way. Mm -hmm. Set expectations and consistent boundaries and be consistent and be firm. One consistent thing that we have is we have to lick, kiss, bite the food, even if it is a non-preferred food. We still have to engage with it and touch it and, and play with it, even though I know that's not necessarily recommended but not to play with your food yeah we totally a, play with i know with but our it's food. like an, it's like an older generation they're like oh don't play with your food well i'm like mm, it's important to play with our food <laughs> you can have a no thank you bowl at the table so a little bowl on the table and if they don't want something in their food or on their plate then they can put it into that bowl instead make sure that you do incorporate both preferred and non-preferred foods on the plate even if your child refuses to have the eggs on the plate, you can have them take it off and put it into their no thank you bowl. But the more that they engage with it, the, the better it will be and the less you know aversive they'll eventually become. Now this is a marathon, this is not a sprint. Yeah, go slow. <laughs> One thing that we did in the clinic oftentimes with our older kiddos who had very, very limited food rapport was to do a, we would make a chart of their non-preferred foods that their parents wanted them to incorporate into their diet. And they had to try it 20 times. And these older kiddos were able to help make the chart, help pick the foods, and then mark off once they had tried it. And once they got to 20 tries, there was some sort of positive reward. And oftentimes what we would see is that they would start to be able to maybe not necessarily like the food and want it, but at least tolerate it more and be more accepting of it. And this is a great thing to do during this activity is to talk about why they're trying this food 20 times. What's the reason behind it? What's the benefit that they're gonna get from this? And again, these are gonna be for the older kiddos who have the receptive and expressive communication skills to do this. Mm -hmm. I actually did this with pickles. I do remember that. And Your I experiment. can tolerate pickles now. I even like them sometimes. Yep. So there you go. It works. <laughs> but I also tried it with olives and I still don't love olives. And that's okay. It is okay. You don't have to like everything. The next piece of advice here is kind of piggybacking on what we've already mentioned. And this is with in this has to do with engaging with the food. So making sure that the child touches the food even if they aren't going to eat it. And we want to reduce the expectations of having to eat it. Maybe they don't like eggs. Maybe you've boiled some eggs and you're having them peel the egg. And there's no expectation to eat it. They're just helping you peel the egg because it's a fun activity and you need some help. But again, you're not saying, Let's take a bite, let's try it, it's time for you to eat it. Just have them peel the egg and be done with it. Move on. Yeah, the more that the child is able to tolerate touching and being around the food, the more likely they will be to eat it later on. Mm -hmm. The next one is going to be to include your child in the meal preparation process. This can include planning the meal of the dinner, the dinner meal, planning it out. <laughs> How many times can I say that in a different way? Uh, making the grocery shopping list, helping at the grocery store to get all of the food, pushing the cart, that is some great heavy work if you have a sensory seeker. So pushing the cart, carrying the big milk jug and putting it in the cart, whatever it is. And then helping unload the groceries at home and put everything away. Getting out all of the ingredients for the meal, Include them in the preparation in some form, having them touch the food, put it away, stir, mix, and then presenting the food. And if you have multiple children, this can be really fun to have the children 
alternate days when they do this. Maybe every weekend one child gets a turn to help with the meal. And this can just be really helpful for the child to feel satisfaction that they helped the family, they prepared something, they created something, and you're teaching a life skill. The next strategy to try is to incorporate your child in the cleanup process after the meal. So our rule in our house is you have to take your plate to either the sink or the dishwasher and load it. And sometimes it's a fight, sometimes it is just, it's what we do. And I think it's important to engage with the food in every aspect, like we've already mentioned, cleaning it off, putting in the dishwasher, maybe help washing the dishes too. That's a fun activity to incorporate them in. And some kiddos really struggle with just looking at the food, touching it, especially if it's not theirs in like a dirty plate scenario. Um, so it can be really beneficial to throw on some gloves if needed, incorporate your child in the cleanup process from start to finish. There were several kiddos that I've worked with in the past and we would do feeding therapy and they had those non-preferreds on their plate and maybe we did an activity with them and they didn't eat the food and that was okay, but then they had to take the plate or the bowl, take it over to the trash can and throw the food away, whether that was dumping it against the trash can to get the food out or using a utensil to scrape it out, but just having them incorporate into that cleanup process is so mm -hmm. beneficial. The last strategy here is messy play games. So things like shaving cream, applesauce, sensory bins with like rice or beans or corn, any way that we can get the tactile system to modulate that sensory input a little bit more efficiently is going to help carry over in the kitchen and at the dinner table as well. So letting a child realize that they can wash their hands after they finished the activity or after they finished the meal is totally acceptable. Yeah. Oftentimes we'll have kiddos who are very tactile sensitive. They don't like their hands to get messy and they're also picky eaters. And so if you can get them to engage with messy tactile mediums with their hands, they're going to start being able to process different types of tactile input better. Their body's gonna learn how to do that. And then if you can incorporate messy play food items even better if you're doing a feeding therapy session and you have yogurt and raisins. Maybe you pour a little yogurt out on the plate and the child has to put the raisins in and then they have to dig the raisins out and then they have to scrape the yogurt into the trash. They didn't eat anything, they didn't touch anything to their mouth, but they engaged with the food in a playful, fun way mm -hmm. and they're gonna be more likely to tolerate those foods later on. Yeah. The goal here is to keep these experiences positive. We don't want there to be negative associations to eating, to meal times. We just want to make sure that this is just this is what we do to survive. We eat and we want to make sure that it's an, an enjoyable experience as much as possible. Yeah. Like we already mentioned, if you have major concerns, seek out OT or speech therapy. Always address any underlying concerns. If there's some underlying medical issues or some dysfunction with their oral structures that's causing a safety concern, make sure you address that first. But try one of these activities and let us know how it goes. Yep. Make sure that you follow us on Instagram as well. That's where we love to hang out at Harkla underscore family, as well as all things sensory podcast. Take a screenshot of you watching the video, not necessarily of you watching the video, but just take a screenshot, tag us on Instagram. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this and maybe if it was helpful. Yep. All right. Well, thanks for being here and we will talk to you next time. Go slow and make it fun, but also do this and do this and do this and do this. <laughs>